looking at Nehemiah 11 and 12, and I called the sermon I preached on this section, It All Ends in Worship. It is a big section, so for me, five pages worth of text to look at, and it's worth reading, so if you haven't already read through the whole section, uh, please do read it. You'll see a lot of names, but look over those names and try and spot some key repetition because they are important names for us to um, look at and understand why they're here. I spend some time praying and ask God to help you to understand His Word. If you are new to this channel and you haven't yet subscribed, I do encourage you to subscribe to the channel and maybe share it with others who you think might find it useful. And I'll be showing now some of what I've seen in the text that will hopefully help you to understand this passage better so that you can also teach it to others. This really is the culmination of all that we've seen in Nehemiah so far. And it's all taking place in Jerusalem. And you'll see a whole lot of the word Jerusalem or the holy city mentioned in this section. And it's worth just highlighting all of this to show that this is the focal point now of all that they are deciding to do. And they also call it the city, the holy city. So all the events of these chapters are taking part in the city of Jerusalem. And just for important context, we've seen a whole lot of things happening in Jerusalem already. Uh, since the beginning in chapter 1 and 2, uh, Nehemiah himself went back to Jerusalem to have a look at the situation and decide how best to, to deal with uh, Jerusalem being in ruins. In chapter 3, they built the walls. Chapters 4 and 5, there was opposition to the building. Uh, chapter 6, they, with God's help, finished that work of building the temple. And then from chapters 8, 9, and 10, we saw the people being rebuilt. But here in chapters 11 and 12, all of that work is now completed. And we're told in the beginning that now the leaders of the people settled in Jerusalem. The rest of the people cast lots to bring one out of every 10 of them to live in Jerusalem. Now they did that because back in chapter 7 verse 4, we were told that the city was completed, but it was underpopulated. And they needed to make sure that Jerusalem was full, for one reason, to protect the city, because enemies coming in would attack Jerusalem if, as the, the focal point of that attack. But another reason why they needed to fill Jerusalem was because this was the holy city, the city of God. And they wanted God's name and fame to be held high in all the world. So they knew that Jerusalem itself needed to be filled. So before we just pick up some specific details from uh, these lists of names, we also see that they speak about the house of God a number of times, or the temple. And what we'll see is that they wanted the right people to be available uh, to to do all the work in the house of God, in the temple. And as we look at these lists, it's important to see the kinds of people that were here. So we're told that the leaders were, many of them were in Jerusalem already. Uh, they speak about the provincial leaders. And throughout the section, you'll see they speak about um, those who were heads of the families and just, uh, you see the cream of the crop are being spoken about, all those who lead in different ways. Now at the beginning of the section, we're told that um, some people from Benjamin and some from Judah are a part of this crowd. Now, those are the only two tribes of the original 12 tribes of, of Israel. Uh, Benjamin and Judah are the only two that are left. The other 10 tribes were taken away um, by the Assyrians, never to be heard of again. But God, in his faithfulness, had preserved a remnant, these two tribes, Benjamin and Judah. And we see them getting mentioned throughout this section. 
So God has faithfully preserved his people. Benjamin and Judah remain. But then as we go through the rest of the list, we'll see, importantly, all of those necessary for worship at the temple were there. Because what we are seeing in this section is that it all ends in worship. Uh, we are seeing that they want to be dedicated to living in thanks and praise for who God is and what he had done. And they were dedicating themselves to live for God's glory. Now, in order for them to worship correctly, they needed priests. So we see throughout this section, priests are mentioned and Levites are mentioned. Now, the priests and the Levites were those who were working in the temple. The priests were those who made sacrifices for the people to deal with sin as well as other things. And the Levites were doing many other things around the temple, uh, leading in the worship, uh, the singing, and looking after the temple building itself. So the priests and the Levites were vital for God's people so that they could uh, worship God rightly. The descendants of Aaron are another way of speaking about the priests. So we've got the people of God, Benjamin and Judah, um, in the city of God in Jerusalem, focusing their energy on the house of God, the place where it was the fo focal point of their worship. And then they've got the priests and the Levites, everyone necessary to do the work within the temple. A specific name that's mentioned a couple of times is the son of Asaph, uh, one of Asaph's descendants. Then we see them again. There's Asaph and Asaph. So Asaph was uh, one of the, the key songwriters in King David's. Uh, Asaph was one of the key, key songwriters. We see a number of the Psalms that are written by Asaph. And here some of his descendants are there, a key group who help God's people to worship God rightly. And then the next very important thing to see in this whole section is this repetition of thanksgiving and songs of thanksgiving. That's what we're seeing. They come to a point where now the work is complete and they want to rightly give thanks to God for all he had done. We're told uh, that they celebrate joyfully. Again, there's thanksgiving. They're giving thanks. In the original, there's actually, it says, the second choir of those who gave thanks uh, should be included in there. And then again, the choirs that gave thanks, they are rejoicing. Because God gave them great joy. Everyone is rejoicing. And this joy in Jerusalem can be heard far away. Again, songs of praise and thanksgiving. And so what we're seeing here is the culmination of all the work that they've been doing. These people realize how good God had been to them, what he had given them, uh, what he had enabled them to achieve. And so they want to give great thanks to God for who he is and for what he had done for them. Some other repetition is, uh, they say, as prescribed by David, the man of God, um, and with musical instruments prescribed by David, the man of God. So David is just mentioned a few times. And his son Solomon here, as in the days of, Mo uh, of David. And in many ways, the real area of focus is here um, from verse 27 onwards. Because in those verses, we get to dedication day. So you see it here, at the dedication of the wall. So God has helped them to do this great work. Jerusalem is complete. And very important to see is here verse 30. So we, we see here that it's more than just the dedication of the wall. When the priests and the Levites had purified themselves ceremonially, they then purified the people, the gates, and the wall. So what these people are doing here is setting themselves apart. 
They are dedicating not just the wall, they're dedicating themselves to be a people who will live for God's glory. And it's an absolutely wonderful picture that we see happening from verse uh, 31 um, through 37. We see one choir and then a second choir. And these choirs go up onto the wall of Jerusalem. And they, they are great choirs, large choirs giving thanks. Now if you contrast what we see here with chapter 4 verse 3, where one of Israel's uh, enemies, Tobiah, had said that even if a fox climbs up on top of this wall, it will come tumbling down. Where here we've got two large choirs on the wall, on top of the wall, one moving around to the dung gate and the other around in the other direction. They are circling the whole city. And from the details that we see, that one heads towards the dung gate and the other heads past the Tower of the Ovens. The details seem to suggest that they went up onto the wall from the valley gate. And the valley gate was a gate we heard about in chapter 2 verse 13, where Nehemiah himself had gone out through the valley gate to look at how bad things were in Jerusalem, how bad the state of the wall was. And on that day, he couldn't even make it around the wall. Where here we have these two large choirs walking around on top of the wall in thanks and praise for all God had done for them. So the taunts of their enemies and the original situation have been turned over. As we were told in chapter 6, with the help of our God, they finished this work. And now they are giving great thanks to God for all that he had helped them and enabled them to do. So this first choir has Ezra, the teacher, with them leading the procession. And the second choir has I, that's Nehemiah himself, with them. And these two massive choirs are walking around the top of the wall. And we see here it mentions the Tower of Hananel. Now we saw this back in Nehemiah 3 verse 1. As we saw people working next to each other, shoulder to shoulder, building the wall. In 3 verse 1, the Tower of Hananel was mentioned. And importantly, that is a tower that was mentioned in Jeremiah 31, verse 38, and Zechariah 14, verse 10. And it means God has favored. Those are the only other places in the Bible that this tower is mentioned. And it's linked with God's great promises, his future promises. After marching around the city, these two choirs uh, join in the house of God. So we're told they took their place in the temple courts together with the officials. And we see again the people, the officials, the priests, they're all there. And these choirs sing. And on that day, they offered these great sacrifices. And there's rejoicing because God had given them great joy. The women and children are rejoicing. Everyone's rejoicing. And the sound of rejoicing in Jerusalem could be heard far away. Now that phrase is very similar to what we saw back in the book of Ezra, uh, which is the early part of the same story linked with Nehemiah. Ezra chapter 3 verse 13. As they had finished with the temple foundations, we're told that uh, a crowd, a, a shout went up and the, the sound could be heard far away. And here the same is happening. Uh, God's people have achieved something incredible with God's strength. And what they are doing is dedicating themselves to live lives of thanks and praise to God for all he had done for them. And they wanted to do that so that God would be glorified through them. They are taking time to just stop and reflect and dedicate themselves to be a people who live for God's glory. And these verses here also show that they are wanting to do what they had committed to do back in chapter 10, to give contributions towards all the work that happened in the house of God. And we see them doing that. So they are dedicating themselves to be a people who will worship God rightly in his house. And for those of them for whom the Tower of Hananel would have rung a bell, pointing them to Jeremiah 31, they may have thought of another passage in Jeremiah just a few chapters later in Jeremiah 33 from verse 10 of that chapter it says thus says the Lord in this place of which you say it is a waste 
without man or beast. So that's talking about Jerusalem. It goes on to say that the voice of joy and rejoicing and gladness will be heard again, bringing thanks offerings to the house of the Lord, saying, Give thanks to the Lord Almighty, for He is good. His love endures forever. So that prophecy from Jeremiah 33 is being fulfilled in all that we see in chapters 11 and 12 of Nehemiah. The people are rejoicing because God has been so good to them. But that prophecy in Jeremiah 33 goes on to speak about, in verse 14 or verse 15, a righteous branch springing up from the house of David. And so all that's happening in Jerusalem here is actually laying the foundation, setting the stage for a later day of celebration when great King David's greater son would walk into Jerusalem. And we saw that we see that happening in the gospel stories as Jesus rides into Jerusalem, the triumphant entry. We see crowds singing his praises. And on that day, he was on his way to save us. Just as they offered these great sacrifices on this day because of who God is and what he had done. On that day, many years later, the righteous branch of David, great King David's greatest son, offered, the, was going to offer, the greatest sacrifice, the full, final, once and for all sacrifice. He offered up himself. And in doing that, King Jesus also secured that day when God's people will not dedic be dedicated in the city of Jerusalem, but when God's people will gather in the new Jerusalem. And on that day, choirs will sing. We read about it in Revelation chapter 7. And they'll be singing praise to the Lamb who is slain. So this picture of what we see happening in Jerusalem is also pointing us ahead to the new Jerusalem. And if you go and read Revelation 21 and 22, we'll see amazing things. We'll see that there is now no need for a temple anymore because the Lord God Almighty and Jesus, the Lamb, are its temple. The focal point of worship for all eternity is going to be in the new Jerusalem, God's people gathered in God's place, under God's rule, enjoying his rest forever. And that is ultimately the picture that this celebration in Nehemiah 11 and 12 is pointing us ahead to. So as you dig further into this great chapter, pray that it will stir your own heart that we will be a people who are dedicated to God in thanks and praise for all he's done. He's given us great joy, greater joy than these people, because we have the joy of knowing the salvation that Jesus won for us. And so our rejoicing should also be something that is heard by others. And let's be praying that our lives would be lived in dedication to God, that every aspect of our lives will be, will be worship, bringing praise and glory to our great God who has saved us. Well, God bless as you dig in further.